All right, I think we will get started. And um, as always, well, first of all, welcome to 2024. Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the first uh, webinar of 2024. My name is David Failing. I'm with Lucas Diesel Systems. And on behalf of Lucas Diesel Systems, we'd like to welcome you to this uh, monthly webinar to let you know we're going to be having these monthly webinars uh, for the, the, the rest of 2024 on a monthly basis. And uh, just before I forget, uh, and I should have said this maybe a couple of webinars ago, for those of you who participate live on these webinars, not watching the recording, but watching the live webinar, we uh, will send you a certificate of participation. So look out for that at the uh, after the webinar is over with. Probably in a, a day or so, we will let you know how you obtain your certificate. So that's always a good thing. Um, in order to avoid any distractions, we've muted everyone so that uh, we avoid any distraction. However, uh, if you do have any questions, I would recommend that you put them in. If you move your mouse around, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you see there's a Q&A and a chat. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going to the Q&A and putting your questions in there, at the end of the webinar, we will be addressing those questions uh, as many as we can. Um, and I'd like to just give a little plug here for Lucas Diesel Systems. Uh, we just returned um, last uh, Friday from the ADS Land HDAW uh, convention down in Grapevine, Texas. And uh, it was great to see a lot of you down there. Appreciate uh, everyone stopping by the Lucas booth. And uh, keep Lucas in mind if you need any uh, common rail parts. Uh, we also have turbos uh, in stock. And now we have a new facility in the Detroit area in which we will be stocking, I guess, um, uh, on this side of the, of the pond, as they call it. We will have a, uh, or already have a, a warehouse on, on this side of the, um, the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So keep us in mind for any parts that you might need. So without further ado, our presenter today is uh, Tony Salas. Most of you know Tony. Uh, he's a veteran technician and instructor on light duty diesel systems, and he runs his own professional shop and training facility in the heart of Las Vegas. He is in, an instructor with Powertrain Training. That's his name of his training facility. So the title to Tony's presentation today is 2024. What is next in diesel technology? Tony, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Mr. David. Once again, nice seeing you again here in another new year of 2024, even though it's almost the end of the month, but time does fly fast. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. How are you? How are everybody doing? Uh, it's been an interesting month, actually, for the month of January. It's been interesting. I've already been doing some training and uh, just got back from a conference and also have worked at a, some uh, two shops actually did some uh, training so therefore welcome hopefully you can all hear me we didn't do a sound check there but hopefully everybody's good and uh, we'll try to answer uh, any questions there um first of all all right as you know tony does not like to cut to the he doesn't like to be indirect more direct if you know what i'm saying um it's been an interesting month but in this case, the phone calls that I keep bringing, you know, I'm sure this phone's going to beep later and, you know, I'm going to get more messages and I got to stay busy. A lot of things going on in terms of our diesel technology and where we are going. So I kind of changed the title a little bit. Where are you going? OK, so in this case, what we're going to talk about here, let's get moving here. We got a few slides, not many slides today, but, you know, where, where are we now in our skills? You know, uh, the D-rate issues on diesel, that's probably the biggest subject is D-rate phone calls that I get a lot of. Um, also, my experiences that I had in 2023 and in this month already of 2024. And then the thing that I've been preaching about is diagnostic skills and attitude. Yes, very important. Um, I often ask yourself, you know, you see these webinars that are thanks to Lucas sponsoring them. But in this case, you know, you ask yourself, what are you looking to get out of it? So let's be straight up. You know, if you're looking for good tips, yeah, obviously there's a lot of great webinars out there and I would like to think I'm one of them. But at the same time, you know, we need to educate ourselves on what's going on, especially now that we're dealing with 2024 models. Early last year, even the year before, back in 22 as well, 
I was talking about the leeway of time of the vehicles that we deal with as independent, well, because most of us are independent, driving service shops, a few distributors. But in this case, where are we at, you know, in terms of, um, you know, our updating ourselves? Because, what? well, first of all, one thing is, what is the newest truck that we're seeing? We're seeing 20 to 1, 22 trucks, you know? And some of us used to be, in the past, it used to be always about a five-year lag between what we got in the shops and what we're seeing now. And in this case, it's different. You know, it used to be a five-year lag. In other words, if it was 2020, we probably wouldn't see anything newer than a 2015. But now that has changed. We're seeing a lot more newer trucks. So we've been having to get up to date on the latest technology because when dealers do train their technicians, they have the latest and greatest, like, for example, for 2024 and 23 model year. We do not have access to that. So therefore, we do have access to the service information. But... We're dealing with these newer truck issues that the dealerships should be dealing with under warranty, but that's another subject. So therefore we're dealing with newer stuff. Technology is changing. The network thing has gotten more evolved. We have discussed in the past about, you know, what we see going on with sensors being now part of the CAN networks and also the LIN networks as well. So the, like I said, the early phone calls we're having is, you know, programming issues and uh, why we need to do programs. So let me just cut to the chase right off the bat when it comes to programming on that third bullet. And that is, we are pretty much living, and we were discussing this over this past weekend over at the conference, was that, you know, we're living in an era now that programming is more than ever, more needed than ever. Because I used to criticize dealerships because when you used to take a truck in for any repair, whatever, any warranty work, it was funny. One of the things they would always do was always update the flash program. This has been going on for years, and that was easy money for them, and they could justify the update. But in this case, you know, we, we as locals and independent shops from wherever you're at, you know, you are actually pro not only programming when you had an issue, but it's now coming to the point that, you know, if I got a D-rate issue, I got a lighting issue, a body issue, a chassis issue, many issues, there are numerous different programming updates. So in this case, that is something we have to keep in mind. Now, the good news is there are many companies out there that are now offering even remote program. So in this case, I've run into them. Like when I went back east early last year, you know, I met some people that were using some companies that were doing some kind of remote program where they send you a pod or some kind of interface and they could literally reflash your trucks or your vehicles right there over the internet. So that's pretty neat. But however, what I guess what I'm trying to say is we're living in an era now that, you know, programming seems to be a main fix or band-aid, if you will, that we're seeing on many diesel vehicles. So that's becoming the issue. So, but, you know, we're, let's go back to that first bullet is where are we now in scale? So I was working at a few shops. I won't name names, but this year and this past year and oh my God, you know, you got to understand I get contracted out for shops and I go work at a shop. I'll teach classes at a shop and I'll have with diagnostics and it's scary. Bottom line, it's scary. Um, when you see vehicles that have been there for a while, when you see the uh, technicians, how they are, it's just amazing. And you, you can imagine me how I am here on screen. How do you think I am at a shop? You know, I'm going to put you under the gun. So we've been t mentioning about the diagnostic skills. And the thing is, we have complaints of, uh, you know, excessive, uh, you got high voltage systems, you got uh, low voltage systems. And what I mean by that, let me let me not confuse you. What I mean by that is we got people that still don't get how to do voltage drop testing on a starting system and an alternator charging system, and it's just scary, you know. Well, we're going to slap our third alternator generator on it. Okay, that still didn't fix it, you know. It's like So I'm like, we're not even talking about engine issues, drivability, transmission, other issues. We're talking about charging system issues, you know, and starting system issues. And the warranty rates are through the roof, and a lot of technicians want to blame the product when in many cases it's not the product. Yes, I've seen bad starters and bad alternators, but it's a sin that a lot of us still don't understand what's going on and how to test a proper charging system in a tar starting system. So, and the thing is when I work with these guys in the shop, it's scary, the attitude they got. It's like, well, you know, they know they're doing wrong. They know they don't know, but they get cocky and try to use that as a defense mechanism to justify their actions. And that's not okay, you know? So, yeah, that attitude is very important. So, therefore, that comes to the last bullet is, you know, where's your attitude at? You know, I've been really pushing this attitude thing for quite a while now. It's because I can't teach you anything. Bottom line is I can't teach you nothing. And you won't learn anything if your attitude is, well, this is as far as I go. I'm going to just fix what I can fix and just BS my way out of it and just keep slapping parts until I think I know what's going on. 
So that's very important to understand is to clear that attitude. It's like, hey, there's many people like me that are teaching out there. There's free webinars also offered by many different companies too as well, but there's also classes to attend. So therefore there needs to be make an investment in yourself. You know, I was watching this shop and this shop actually starting to do hybrids and they're taking a few EVs and they had it for the first time I saw this shop, they had a Tesla come in there and they say, well, you know, it came in with a totally dead. How do we approach that when it's totally dead? So they're taking on the EV. I'm like, this is great. You guys are trying to take that on. They're already coming around into their shop. So therefore, you know, that creates a little bit of an issue, but let's, let's apply this. Okay. You know, I recently did a class on 6.0 and I was this last week also I was doing talking about the diagnostics and the problem is we have to be well-rounded as technicians. You know, we have to be well-rounded. What I mean by that is this old slide, believe it or not, this slide is from 2004. And in this case, when I talk about, you know, the operation of a six liter, and, and that's one of the last of the Huey styles in uh, light duty trucks that were out there, that six liter is the fact that, you know, you got a, a, a hydraulic side, then you got the fuel side, and then you got the electronic side of things. In other words, the sensors and the computers and so on. And one of the key elements the guy still missed to the T is compression, right? It's the compression. Well, technology has changed now ever since I started teaching this back in 03, 04, is because now we see the automotive sector been using, and they've been using it for quite a while, doing relative compression tests using a scope. The problem is that 90% of us out there in the diesel repair sector, whether, whether being light duty, medium duty, or even class A, we're very weak in lab scopes. So if I offer a lab scope presentation, I can't fill it. I can't sell it. If I talk about electrical, how to learn about how to read electro, I can't do it. I can't sell it. So how in the holy heck am I going to teach you how to do a relative compression test using the scope? So therefore, you know, you got to change your attitude a little bit because it makes diagnosing a lot easier. Hell, I'm okay just knowing do I have on a, on a no crank, no start or lack of power is that would it be great to do a relative compression test just to tell me the overall condition of that engine? But don't get me wrong, I'm still old school. I'm one of those people that still believes that you ought to be using a compression gauge, you know. So therefore, we definitely want to do that. But in this case, we got to know how things work. Like when we diagnose a sensor, let's say the ICP sensor, as you can see on that diagram. If I talk about ICP sensor, we're talking about desire and actual ICP pressure, but I take it a step further. And that step further is when you diagnose a sensor or you're using a sensor to diagnose a vehicle, isn't it a good idea to actually look at the signal voltage because I can be in inhibit mode. And one thing I discussed recently was, do we understand what inhibit mode is? Because we can often associate that with something called uh, some kind of default value. And when we talk about default values, in other words, I can have desired and ICP pressure be exactly the same on a no crank, no start condition. And you're gonna notice you're going to have 800 PSI desired, 800 actual, and they're matching exactly the same. But little do you know that in this case, it is in default mode. I guess what I'm trying to say is it requires 500 PSI, like the slide shows right there, what you need to start. But the scan tool is going to display the actual and desired as the same because it's in default value. But then you pop up the ICP signal voltage and you're going to find out you might be reading zero or five volts, which it should not be. So we need to be looking at ICP signal voltage, but that applies to any sensor. If I'm looking at a map sensor, a barrel sensor, whatever sensor I'm looking at that has a variable voltage signal, I'm going to see that that signal voltage is changing. So it's important to understand that. But then, you know, I can look at this diagnostics and when we got things that don't make sense, we've been talking about checking power and grounds. And when I teach electrical classes, and I get into voltage drop testing, I try to teach, I even got a YouTube video showing a quick thing on a circuit board talking about how to properly check power and ground to a computer. And when I'm on the phone with a guy, like I had three calls this weekend and I, I really don't like to take calls on weekends. because I like to have my own time off, but I took the calls because the football games were not going in my favor, you know, freaking Lions. But anyway, that's another thing. But the thing is, what I'm trying to say is it wasn't going in my favor, the football games was the fact that this guy's trying to, he, I guess he was diagnosing a truck on a Sunday. You know, how do I check powers and grounds? And this is a tech. And I'm like, okay, dude, I don't have time to open up my laptop so I can show, show you which terminal, which terminal goes to the computer. So it's kind of irritating. He was really irritating me, but it kind of tells you where your skills are at. 
is that do you know how to check powers and grounds going to a computer? Because I've always said in the past, when you're diagnosing a vehicle, even the 6.0, like you could see here on the screen that we're talking about, is that, you know, do you know how to check powers and grounds? Do you know where to check it? And do you know how to do it properly? Because if you're one of those guys that's disconnecting the connector and measuring voltage right on the connector with a circuit open, you're doing it wrong. You know, so that's what we call voltage drop test. We got to do it right. So, But in this case, what I'm trying to say is very important. You know, last month <clears throat> we did a nice presentation on different uh, subjects. But in this case, you know, we talk about also the FICM itself, the relays. And that's another one, relays. Guys don't know what relays are. And that's very frustrating. So let me throw one at you here. This was actually one of my phone calls over the weekend. I decided to use it. He's telling me, and then Joe, sorry, I'm putting you under the gun here. I'm showing you in case you're watching. But in this case, he's telling me he's got no communication to the ECM. So let's use a little higher. Let me show you here. Because believe it or not, what you're looking at is a little bit of old technology here. But let's go ahead and show you here. All right. So what he says is that he has no communication to the ECM. So there's my ECM right there. Okay. Again, this is during football. So you can imagine how agitated I was getting. Here we go. Where's the starting point? Well, the starting point is over here. I'm, I, we're really happy that this system is very basic. And believe it or not, it is basic. There you can see on the bottom where I just circled 14 and 6. That is your CAN communication talking. So if we understand CAN takes place at 6 and 14, but that's another class that we've covered too as well this. But anyways, we're going to see it splices over over here on splice 290. And there's splice 290. Hopefully you can see that all on your screen. Now we're going to notice here there's a data link resistor right here. OK, and in this case, that data link resistor has 120 ohms. So if we follow this whole dang thing, we're going to find out that also at the ECM, we also have another what? 120 ohm resistor. Now, if you've been reading these manuals, if you've been diagnosing, it follows the laws of a parallel circuit. Now, what are the laws of a parallel circuit? That if you've got two parallel circuits and those circuits are in I mean, those resistors are in parallel, then therefore to take to know the total resistance is less than the least amount. So I know that it's less than 120 ohms, but it also states that if you have the same value, in this case, I have two 120 ohm resistors in this circuit, right? And it all started where? It all started over here at X, which was the data link connector. So <coughs> I sent this guy, <coughs> excuse me. I sent this guy a, um, a diagnostic procedure that this guy had put up on Identifix. I said, just follow this guy. He's pretty much, he did it. He did my homework for you to teach you. And he's having troubles with it. So here's what he's saying. Well, according to 14 and six, if I measure the resistance at 14 and six with the power off, how many ohms should I have? Well, this is two parallel circuits right here that you're looking at. So how many ohms should we have? 60. Okay, where did we get the 60? Two branches divided by into 120. What is 120 divided by two? The 60. So therefore, the chart even said you're supposed to have 100, uh, excuse me, not 120, 60 ohms. So guess what he's getting? He's getting 120 ohms. So immediately, I know that the other resistor is not in play. And he also is complaining that, hey, I do not have any communication at point Z right there. Okay. So therefore, from point X to point Z, I got no communication. So this is making sense to me, okay? Because I only got 120 ohms. So which 120 ohms is it probably reading? Well, it's probably reading the 120 ohms from here. So those of you who haven't caught on, we're measuring the resistance between 14 and 6. You're supposed to have how much? 60 ohms. But in this case, we have what? 120 ohms. So therefore, I know he's probably reading this bottom one here. <laughs> so with that said... Who is the big guy right here? Well, first of all, it's going to be a little confusing for those of you. It even took me a while, but you're going to notice there's a manual transmission and there's an automatic transmission side of to this, to this truck. So therefore, obviously, the manual transmission will not have a transmission control module. You follow that? So in this case, that would mean these wires right here will go to the transmission control module, right? And then you're going to have these two wires going where? Over to here. That's the way it should have been drawn. All right. So how many CAN wires coming in and out of the TCM? Well, we have how many? Well, you actually have a redundant right there on the high-speed CAN. But in this case, you got a total of high-speed CAN, high-speed CAN. And you have how many? It looks like we have five, don't we? So therefore, that would mean that speed uh, communication takes place between, again, data link connector. And I'm going to make it really ugly, this diagram, but I'll erase it. Don't worry. 
So we start off here at the data link connector, ta-da, and we follow these wires and they will go to the TCM. From the TCM at that point, it's gonna go straight over to whom? The glow plug controller, okay, or glow plug control module. And in this case, from the glow plug control module, we exit out and it goes straight up over to whom? The ECM, okay? And that's what we see going. Hopefully you're all catching on to this, all right? So therefore, that's what we see. Ta -da, I told you I'd take care of it. So therefore, okay, he has 120 ohms when he goes from 14 to six. So all I said was, okay, let's first check continuity between cavity six and cavity six because those two are interchangeable on that 10 and white wire. You'll notice the white wire, uh, 10 and white wire right there. 10 and white wire, I'm not saying that correctly. And then you got a 10 wire right there. So therefore, in this case, the 10 is pin 16. So you got to check continuity between those two. So in this case, he's telling me he has an open, which makes sense, okay? And you're saying, well, how is it that he's measuring 120 ohms? Because he's already spliced right here. He's measuring that resistance right here, around here. Doesn't involve the TCM. So to make a long story short, turns out he's got an open, right? And the thing is, now it got a little interesting because he's telling me he's got an open. He's not getting no continuity between, and by the way, let me clear this, hold on, come on. Hello, my PowerPoint's taking a while. But anyways, what that tells me is from this point here to this point here, he actually has no continuity on both the 10 and white wire and the 10 wire. So that's where his problem seems to be. I said, well, you got one of two choices. You either have a connector problem, and I suspect you got a connector problem. So verify the connector at the transmission control module. But then this is where the challenge came in. We have another connector right here, okay, which is connector 101. So what I'm teaching you right now is pretty much just basic, okay? To me, it's basic because it's something we ought to know. So when I talk to technicians like himself and other technicians that I'm helping to diagnose communication problems, when I mention about the 120 ohms and the other 120 ohms, you know, they're like, I don't know. So therefore, this kind of sets the precedence that we need to understand, A, how to read these wiring diagrams, and C, understand how the system works. So therefore, it is two-wire communication. There's a can high and can low, and I'll show you a lab scope you're reading here in a little bit of one where you can monitor that. So therefore, we have to look at the complete wiring diagram, how it works. And this is a simple one because most of all the newer trucks, and when I say newer, 2017, 2016, and newer, you know, it, yeah, I can't fit it all on one page. This is all fitted on one page, so this is kind of cool, but because all we got is a TCM, a data link resistor, a glow plug control module and an ECM. That's pretty much all we got. That's the basic of basics of high speed CAN right there. So you got to understand A, how to read the wiring diagram, B, know what CAN is, what's CAN low, CAN high, because you're going to notice here, if you look very closely, there's a plus and a minus one. And those toggle at different levels, average of two and a half volts, but it's going to toggle. So we got to understand how it all viewed. So the moral of the story is when you look at these diagrams and you're not familiar with this, you ask yourself, why do they put a 120 ohm resistor over here? Why is there a separate resistor here, not in a module? Because it's for a diagnostic purpose to help you diagnose. So yeah, between six and 14, we're supposed to have 60 ohms, but in this case, you only had 120 ohms. So therefore there was an open between those 10 and 10 and white wires to find out what's going on. So I left him there. So I don't know where he is. And he didn't call me yesterday because I was getting a little irritated with him because to me, this is something you should know, you know, and this is something you should know too. So again, that's why we have classes to teach all this. So everybody understand my point? I hope you understand my point. So, you know, yeah, when you show wiring diagrams technicians like I just did at a shop that I was at, you know, they're pretty much trying to follow and some of them are good about highlighting or printing, whatever, or using the pro demand or Mitchell kind of diagrams. That's great, whatever works for you. I like the four diagrams as you can see here, but we need to understand what we're looking at, you know? For example, when I've talked about four power strokes, 6.7, you know, I've shown in the past, where's my mouse there? Um, I've shown in the past, you know, do we understand, you know, a lot of this, like the fuel pump monitor, right? And in this case, the fuel pump control right there, you know, we got different terminologies we have to know. So we have to understand that. But then again, this past weekend, when I was teaching at a conference, some technicians did not understand what was the difference between a wide frame and a narrow frame, you know? So, and I'll give you the answer, one super duty, and one is the cab chassis. That's what you're looking at. The wide frame, wide frame is the super duty for those of you that don't know. But regardless, when we're diagnosing, one of the things we got to keep in mind is, you know, power 
and grounds are very important. I mean, we're going to look right here at this ground right here, and we got to learn how to check it. So that kind of goes back to voltage drop testing. You know, do we know how to properly test for voltage? And if you say power probe, I'm going to kick your butt. Do not say power probe. We don't want to put power probe there. So therefore, no, no power probes at all you want to be using. So the problem is nowadays, I'm this year, you're going to find me. Let me get rid of my little mouse here. But in this case, nowadays, we're pretty much, you know, at an era now that we're, we should be using, like our automotive technician counterparts, we should be using a lab scope to analyze signals. So as you look at this signal right here, the question begs, do we understand what we're looking at? You know, in this case, <clears throat> is this a communication network? Is this a, an on-off frequency signal? What are we looking at? And then what are my abilities of a lab scope, lab scope? So I guess for those of you that have been good technicians and you want to become better technicians, you know, because I know there's good ones out there, is that are you taking an initiative to try to learn what a lab scope does for you and what it can help you do so you can understand what's going on? But in this case, we got to learn the basics. So something you're going to see me offer in my webinars coming up in my teaching, my classes is now I'm going to get high and heavy on lab scopes. I'm going to try to do that. But the problem is, when I try to teach lab scopes, I find myself, these technicians don't understand the three different wires on a, a certain reference circuit or sensor, like a map sensor, for example, or understanding a thermistor like we use on an, a coolant temperature sensor and so on. So therefore, I can't teach you lab scopes if you don't understand even the things as difference between AC and DC, you know. So therefore, again, the need for electrical training, because here you're going to look at your can low and can high wire right there that I took a sweep of. So in this case, you are literally looking at your communication of that six and 14 we just saw in the earlier. So in this case, we got to know how it all works and what's it actually toggle between what, which I'm not going to get into right now because that's all part of a CAN class. But in this case, we have to understand what we're looking at on the communication side. And for those of you that are technicians, you better look at what some of these companies are doing. You know, there's shops here in Vegas, you know, where I'm here at that actually are, you know, like for example, I got this Jeep thing that, these guys are converting Jeeps over from, you know, L excuse me, from the stock motor, they're putting LS motors and they're putting 392s, you know, uh, Ram in, you know, Chrysler, whatever, whatever company, what's it called now? Scalantis, Scalantis. But anyways, they're putting these motors and here you're, in other words, they're putting a GM system, which is a GM land can system into a jeep system which is all part of you know their network of jeep and in this case they figured out how to translate their version of can to this version of can because it's all very it should be almost the same but in this case in other words you don't have to change your gauges so kind of it's amazing what the aftermarket is doing to, to adapt to work with can communication so in this case it's amazing but <clears throat> can is taking over a lot you know if you've been following what's going on even your headlights you know you look at a ford super duty or f-150 you're going to see the lights themselves have modules within the rear tail light. Maybe you've seen that video where I just saw it not too long ago. This guy complaining about how expensive it is to repair a rear tail light because it's got sensors. It's got CAN modules for lighting, turn signals, all that. In other words, that's all part of a local CAN network that you're seeing there. So, again, another need to understand how to use and how to work because guess what? <clears throat> like I just said, something as simple as your Headlamp repair or tail light repair is going to involve, believe it or not, networks. So you got to get up to speed on that, man. You got to get up to speed because are we talking about cheap modules? No, we're talking about expensive modules. And he's actually talking about a light that actually had just water intrusion and caused a lot of damage in those model modules internal into that tail light. But I'm looking back at this. I'm like, well, if you don't know that 6 and 14 that we just talked about here, you know, I'm sorry. We're going to have problems. So if this does not make sense to you, it's going to have to make sense to you. You know, so we have to know how it all works. So therefore, hopefully you're learning that and uh, make it a point. Okay. Okay. Obviously, we, we Lucas, go to the Lucas, um, uh, Lucas uh, YouTube page. And if you get a chance, I did do a presentation. If you look at all the different presentations, you're going to see that one of them I did was on basic networks. So therefore, you're welcome to look at that. So if not, <clears throat> get some training. All right, skipping gears. Since we have so much time here to talk about this, we're already a half hour already, <clears throat> is uh, talking about the, uh, the relevance of issues with common rail. Okay. GM is the worst one right now. My majority of my drivability phone calls are four to get get them reset when they're derated. And my second most popular phone calls is L5P. 
L5P, L5P, L5P with common rail injection issues. And we talked about that also on another Lucas presentation. So again, go visit the YouTube page for Lucas. But in this case, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we tend to forget about what's going on with the engine. You know, we still got an engine there, guys. I know I've been talking, this is an old slide that I actually grabbed from one of my previous presentations. And in this case, we're talking about the relevance of the cylinder contribution. So in this case, that will affect fuel timing and fuel quality codes. So I get a lot of phone calls, a lot of phone calls about L5P with those type of issues. And in this case, you know, those that have had training understand what I'm saying, but others that haven't, you know, we're having issues. And what we mean by that is, you know, compression is very key, but also the breathability of that engine, both on the intake side and on the exhaust side. So we're dealing now with many different trucks that have, you know, we got, you know, we, in other words, we got an intake, we got an exhaust system. And in this case, we have to understand that frivolous things like an air filter, you know, is, is going to get you in trouble. And, you know, I know I've been talking about that. I know some of you guys that are religious about attending these things. I appreciate you. But those of you that haven't, you know, we still are doing diagnostics the wrong way. And, you know, when we talk about step one of diagnostics is to visual verify the complaint. Then step two is to go ahead and do a visual, open that hood up for a drivability problem. You want to check everything. You know, recently, like I said before, I was talking to the transmission shop here in town the one that I like to use. And it was amazing. I said, you know, if you got a minute, dude, I got just got a quick question. How many transmissions have issues have you repaired by just some, simply just checking the batteries or cleaning batteries or grounds? He says, Tony, all the time. It happens all the time. So I'm like, so why are we doing all this kind of replacement and repair without verifying those basics, right? But then when it comes to the engine itself is its breathability. In other words, the air filter, you know, how's that air filter? And if you've been doing enough smoke testing, and I've taken a survey already because I'm a big smoke tester. What do I mean by that? They sell high-pressure smoke testers now for diesels. It's a it's a rather not so expensive, but expensive uh, investment. But boy, does that puppy pay for itself fast. And what I mean by that is smoke testing those intakes for issues that can cause erroneous readings from A, the mass airflow sensor, B, the MAP sensor. Because let's face it, do we have good technicians doing proper repair? Let's say a guy does a turbocharger. What did he do with the intake, EGR issues, and so on? So I guess what I'm trying to say is we need to smoke to test those intakes. And it's becoming a point now that it's going to become mandatory to be doing it. And if you look at Ram Cummins and other service information, they're calling for you to do a smoke check on various different diagnostic trouble codes. Yeah, it's out there. So again, we have to see the breathability, how well it breathes in it sucks in the air but then the exhaust also plays a relative role so in this case that exhaust is going to be a main player here so is it surprising that i will get a drivability problem let's get a, let me give you an example the classic one is i get a mass airflow code i got mass airflow i like quickly look under my pids before i continue on i did my proper visual inspections but i'm going to go ahead now and look at the scan tool and i've checked the air filter and all that and I'm going to go ahead and look at mass airflow value. And I see some value. I don't know what the value is, but I see a value. Okay, I see, let's say, uh, 19, 20 grams, whatever it might be. But the thing is, what I will do is, okay, before I even continue, let's take a look at a DPF. And I ask many technicians is, how do you know your diesel particulate filter is actually loaded? Well, you look at the differential pressure. That's a good reading. And I see that it's got 2.8 PSI. And if we know the magic number, it's three PSI, which justifies us to say, hey, you know, I got a loaded or part loaded DPF. So will a loaded DPF cause mass airflow readings to be wrong? Yes, it will. So therefore, if in the exhaust we're restricted, it's going to back it all up and it's going to affect your mass airflow readings. So in this case, I will run a regeneration event. I will sell a regeneration event and we'll perform a regen. At that point, we'll reevaluate. And believe it or not, I have fixed through time, I fixed a few vehicles where we had, you know, mass airflow codes and all we did was a regeneration. So in this case, we have to understand that. Okay. Now, those of you that deal like back east, when I went back in April, May, when I went back east, I can't tell you how many deleted trucks I saw. And, you know, they turn off all these codes and stuff. Regardless, though, if you're running a pretty high horsepower tune, I call it stupid tune now. But in this case, when you're running a stupid tune, you know, you're going to actually generate a lot more back pressure between the exhaust manifold and the turbo inlet on the up pipes. That creates a lot of hellacious amount of heat, which affects, again, the engine itself and the life of the engine. 
But overall, when we talk about the higher boost, we talk about the after train, we talk about the intake issues, like it says right there, how does it affect the engine oil? And this continues to be a subject. And we and we hit hard and heavy on it at this presentation this past weekend about engine oil. And people ask, you know, well, when should I be changing that oil? Well, we got to change it more frequently than what the manufacturers are calling for. This 10,000 mile does not work. So therefore, that will affect. And why am I going to that? For those of you that have heard this already, I'm hitting hard and heavy on blow by. The more I see these TikTok stupid videos, the more I see more of these YouTube, it's like everybody accepts the blow by. It, no, it's not okay to have excessive blow by. It's like it, when most of you are checking blow by, you're checking it with the engine idle. But what you're not thinking is what is the blow by under a loaded? Let's say this truck's pulling 15,000 pounds. What's going to be the blow by at that point? So in this case, that creates an issue is that you need to understand that maintenance is also another thing. But when you're diagnosing it, you better look at blow by because have we fixed vehicles before with had re frequent regeneration because of excessive blow by? And guys said, change the CCV filter, you know, the closed crankcase ventilation filter. That's a filter, but you're not getting to the bottom line that you may have excessive blow by. You know, so that's something that's you got to keep in mind. So. When we look at scan data now, and you look at your PID list here, you know, we use, we talk about the, when you're doing the scans and you're doing your um, evaluation, I, there's so many technicians that just don't know what they're looking at. And there are service information that does help you, you know, read and understand some of this. For example, as I play this recording right here, I think this is a three liter Duramax. And one thing I was showing is setting up, you know, when you're doing diagnosis is setting up your your scan tool the way I like it. For example, I'm looking at desire and actual fuel pressure, and I'm also looking at lift pump pressure because that is displayed on the truck, the tool. But you'll notice on the right-hand side, I can see fuel pump speed command, fuel pump variance. In other words, are you taking advantage of all the different scan tool values and know how to use the graphing side of your scan tool so you can take full advantage of what you're looking at, man? And in this case, that's something very important to look at is like, how well are you setting up your scan tool to understand what you're looking at? Because I hate the technician that comes up to me and gets cocky and says, well, I only learn when I'm in the shop. Okay, dude, here's the scan tool. God bless you. Go figure it out. Because let me tell me, what are you looking at right here? Because if you don't know how the system operates, I'm sorry, you're not going to understand what you're looking at. here. You know, not that I'm trying to be mean. It's just that, you know, this is the reality of our business, what we need to understand and look at. So... Shane, the scan tool I'm using is my Snap-on Zeus. This is my Snap-on Zeus that I'm using. Good question, Shane. There you go. But in this case, what I'm trying to say is, you know, set up your scan tool. But then, well, let me freeze this here for a second. What you're not realizing is now what's available to you. And this is the cool thing. I love this when I look at these trucks is. Take a look right here. As a matter of fact, let me change my highlighter pin here. Uh, you're going to notice right here that you are now going, if I haven't hit high and heavy, where's it? There we go. You're going to see these okay signals right here, okay? What it is now is that I've always said that a diagnostic trouble code is a test, but now he's telling you, do I have a circuit high voltage, you know? Do I have circuit lows too? So you're going to see a series of these. You're going to see them all right here. Of What he's just testing is fuel pressure regulator one, two, and three, okay? So he's now telling you on the PID list, what is the conditions of these, you know, these circuits here? So in this case, I'm looking at the fuel pressure regular. He's doing a lot of my diag. You can assist this diag if you want to go ahead and wiggle because this kind of clearly tells you that, like I said, five, 10 years ago, that what is OBD2 doing? Testing, 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 testing. Well, this is clearly shown right here. This is something that's newer on the newer trucks now that you're going to see in the software. So therefore, you're going to see that just scrolling down, you'll be able to notice, do I have a circuit malfunction? That's why I believe in the Ford wiggle test, like I said, because you can wiggle, and if all of a sudden it says not okay or you got an error, you're going to see it right there on the PID list. So in other words, let's say I get a code for fuel pressure regulator 2 circuit issue, right? Well, I can go diagnose before that. I can pull up these screens, and I can say, okay, let me wiggle and jiggle. Let me see if it actually goes to not okay. You know, I see a failure. So in this case, that's what you're looking for. So in a way, some softwares from some manufacturers like GM have made it easier for you to view. So therefore, that's pretty cool there. So, so in other words, get to know well what's available on your, you know, your scan tool and your scan tool data, what you can view because it's pretty cool. I mean, I look to the right there 
you know, you're looking at your fuel pump module five volt reference, which has been given to you in the past by other manufacturers and GM too as well. But in this case, it helps you understand what's going on. You know, we often talk about, <laughs> excuse me, we talk about the three phase signals coming off the lift pump, right? We've been teaching that for a while. And in this case, when you're looking at that, it'll tell you the condition of each circuit of the, of the three phases. Phase, you know, the U, W, H, whatever they're called. In this case, it'll show you that. So kind of cool. So again, take advantage of understanding your scan tools. So that kind of brings us to a main point is how many of you guys take time on your days off and when the shop is slow is let's scan a known good vehicle. Because when you talk about lab scopes and you talk about scan, uh, scanning the vehicle and understanding what you're looking at with PIDs and all the functions that are available is for you to take time to work on a known good vehicle. So you can understand what you're looking at. Because you know, if you don't know what values are, then you're going to be a little lost. The good news is some manufacturers like GM, Ford offers some, actually Ford does offer them a whole bunch, is that they give you typical scan tool data values, and that's available from the service information. And that's why I like to use, not that I favor one or the other, but the reason why I like Identifix is because Identifix gives me actually uh, the access to that manufacturer, Ford to Ford, GM to GM, RAM to RAM. It'll give me that information there. So, and I could read up all the data there. So, so in this case, again, take advantage of what's available on the scan tool so you can understand there. So very important. Okay. Doing good. All right. Next thing, common rim. Now everybody wants to talk about the CP4. Don't get me started on that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch other videos. <laughs> Here's the deal. You know, do all Power Stroke 6.7s, for example, or Duramax LMLs, do they all have grenading failures? In other words, what about that truck that comes in that has low rail pressure but has a good CP4? Or maybe a CP4 that hasn't self-destructed, okay? So, yeah, we've been dealing with a lot of different issues, and the 6.7 seems to take the lead not too far back from the Duramax. So with that said, you know, what do you do to diagnose a low, a crank no start condition when you got low rail pressure? So, you know, it always starts with me with lip pump pressure, volume, and then we're going to check the rest. In other words, a common rail system has a low pressure, a high pressure, and a return. It does not make sense for you to diagnose the high pressure side, once again, if you have not diagnosed the low pressure side. But then again, you know, we like to do volume. I'll go back with what Cummins says, and I still will stick with Cummins. Cummins has always been telling us to always check volume. That rule of one liter in 30 seconds still works to the day. You know, you can look at pressures, and that's important to understand. You're right. But in this case, we need to have that volume of fuel. What about that truck that's cutting out and lacks power, you know? Do we have some issues going with the lift pump? Because you know what? You know, when I was working with one of my former techs, you know, he was showing me a dump truck with a 6.7 where actually the old fuel pump assembly, in other words, the um, the pump slash fuel filter assembly, the hose coming were actually kinked. So therefore, that's why we had durability. And here, us idiots, we were focusing up here in the engine compartment without ever bothering to take a peek underneath at the lift pump and the lines themselves. So it kind of made us look stupid, but, you know, he figured it out that we had a restricted problem. So therefore, yeah, we had pressure, but we didn't have the volume. That's what I'm trying to say. So it isn't surprising. It's not shown here on the picture, but it is surprising that at that secondary filter right there in the engine compartment that, uh, you know, we're checking volume. So therefore, Eon, I'm going to look for what? In one liter, 30 seconds. Hell, if you want to look a soda bottle, whatever you got to do to do that volume test with three eighths or half inch hose, whatever you need, you know, go ahead and measure that volume coming out of that filter to see if you have the volume. Because if you do have restrictions, you got trash in that tank or in that primary filter, you're going to find it there. So in this case, please make a note to do that. Very important to do that. Okay, so lip pump pressure and volume. Okay, now we get into our high pressure side. So you're looking at this V8 application. you got all these lines. Here's the sad fact about a 6.7. The sad fact about a 6.7, like I've said before, is the fact that all these lines that you see there, and if I'm not correct, yep, all these lines you're looking at on this diagram are not reusable. So one thing, if you are doing diagnostics, you need to sell the customer some lines, right? Because you're going to need to put lines back on if they don't want to fix it, right? Or you can put the old lines back on, just on the take their old lines. But anyways, I like to always go to the back of that. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, we got our fuel pump, uh, fuel pump. We got our high pressure valve here. This guy is controlling what? What's this guy called? 
Oh God, I'm running a brain fart here. We got our volume control valve. We got our pressure control valve, PCV. There you go. So we got our PCV there. And yeah, we'll take the inner fender off on that driver's side and we'll remove it because what are we trying to establish? Do I have a contaminated system? So don't waste time. You know, you want to go ahead and check to see if you do have a contaminated system. So it's, some guys will say, well, I'll do that first and I'll do the lip pump pressure or volume test, Tony. It's up to you. But in this case, you want to check A, lip pump pressure volume, and you also want to check again, any contamination. So some of you I know are going to number five right there and you're removing that fuel pressure regulator on the volume control valve there. So you're checking for contamination there. But I always like to go easy one because let me tell you, to me, it's easier to get to that uh, pressure control valve than that you know, volume control valve there on number five. So number 10 is easier than number five. That's what I'm trying to say. So if it's not contaminated and you still don't have enough volume, here's what I finally come to the conclusion of. I'm at the point now, before I used to talk about the next step was the cap test. Well, after dealing with so much CP4s and I know I'm going to need lines and I know I'm going to have to get involved with this, I will often take the lines off the CP4 pump. Let me circle here. In other words, I take these two lines off now because this will tell the story. Again, this is not a grenaded CP4, so don't get excited. So what I will do is I'll take those two lines off and I'll crank the engine over and see what's spitting out out of those two piston assemblies. Okay, so therefore I'm going to look at what's coming out of here and what's coming kind of out of here. And you know what? Nine out of ten times for those trucks that have uh, low rail pressure, it's not the injectors. It's also been what? The CP4, one spit now fuel, pump, pump, pump. You'll see a splash of fuel coming out of each little port because there's just two of them again. And the other one, nothing. So immediately I go, okay, well, we got a CP4 that's gone. Something's gone wrong internally. In it. So in other words, I need a CP4, you know, that's what she. Now I do know on those trucks, like those F650, 550, 650s, we're no, we know that we're seeing erosion on the, on the injectors. So what we're doing now is on those trucks, is that, you know, you got to ask yourself what took out the CP4 if that's the case, right? So we've gotten to the point now that a lot of us are taking off all the injector lines and cranking it over to see if we got compression gases coming through the injector. Yes, you heard me correctly. Compression gas is coming up through that injector because on those trucks that do heavy load, low speed, a lot of idle period, a lot of PTO running, these are the ones that we're going after for the eroded nozzles. And that's what we're seeing there. So in this case, we're asking you to go ahead and you may have to do a compression leak test on those injectors. And what do you do? You take all the lines off and you crank it over and you see which one's spitting out compression out of it. And it's been successful for us. So something you got to do. Your average super duty trucks, no, we don't see that too much. But on those super duties that do have, that might be a tow truck, you know, that might have running long PTO loaded, that's where we tend to see the problem there. So. If you see another similar, let me know. Put it on the chat window. I'll be more than happy to ask, answer that for you. All right. What else do we have to understand? Well, the other thing we got to look at, and I don't know if this is working well. I had problems with it earlier. Uh, is um, do we understand what we're looking at with fuel trimming? And in this case, fuel trimming is very, very, very critical. And what I mean by that is, um, let me get rid of this is uh, as you can see my cursor right there is, you know, we see these scales of cylinder balancing like this is off an IDS on a partial six, seven, once again, and you're gonna see these microgram changes, okay? These are microgram changes. So if you don't know what a micro is, it's what? Let's see, there's milli and then there's micro, right? So if it's milli, then micro, so it's thousands, and then we got what? Millions changes. So these are very small changes. But then again, if you look at the scales right here, hopefully you can all see that is that you're gonna see that we're in milligrams, but yet the changes that you're gonna see right here on the left are in micrograms. This is a good, known, good running truck. So as I play it here, <clears throat> you're gonna see, <laughs> see that the changes are pretty normal. So therefore, I'll take a look at that. The numbers are changing from five micrograms to 45 micrograms, number four, for example, and you're gonna see these changes. These are my new changes, but this is why I like the graph because I'm trying to graph these and I'm looking at this on my IDS can tool, I'm looking at the small changes. So this is not a bad running truck. So the question begs, you know, if you look at the Ford Service M4, they're gonna tell you, take a look at the cylinder balancing rates and see which injector might be falling out. Well, you're like, well, gee, they all seem to be falling out left to right, but what's too much and what's too little, you know? Well, all I gotta do is look at the micrograms. So in this case, 
the highest I see right now is 800, cylinder number six is 835 micrograms. That's only micrograms, not even one milligram, okay? So therefore, is that okay? Believe it or not, it is. <clears throat> so how do I know this? It's because we've been scanning trucks over and over and over again to get an idea where we're supposed to be. <clears throat> so very important to understand that. So therefore, you guys got to do the same. But what am I looking for? So people often ask, well, what do you look for to? And I go, anything greater than two milligrams. So if I see, you'll notice four milligrams is the scale over here to here. So therefore, somewhere halfway, if one injector starting to skew off, that's telling you that injector's got some issues going on, right? Now, this is under the understanding. Don't look at this if you have not looked at relative compression, okay? Because if you haven't looked at relative compression, will comp low compression or just slightly low compression on one cylinder cause this to be off? And the answer is yes. So this is under the understanding. You are looking at that. So do you have a low dead hole or something like that so that's where us learning hopefully we'll learn or teach this in the near future here is learning how to do a relative compression test now this software right here ideas does it for you there is an ability for you to run a relative compression test but if i'm using my snap on guess what it doesn't offer it but this cancel does and that's why we pay the money to have the ids because we do a lot of four trucks and yeah ids is a good tool to have so makes sense but this is a fine-tune adjustment to get that ideal feel that only occurs at idle. So therefore, it's under the assumption that everything else is okay. You know, and what I mean by that, no intake issues, no EGR issues, no exhaust issues, right? You got no other things going on. That's where you can scrutinize how well those injectors are working. But I'll be honest with you, I can get this pattern to look cleaner. In other words, squeeze them in more by just simply running a fuel cleaner, you know? There's like I was saying in the previous presentation about additives, like I like to use the BG245. <coughs> and it isn't surprising that with the BG245, it actually cleans up those nozzles and it, actually those fuel trims get a little better. There are other fuel additives to use that you can use too as well. So there you go. All right. Now the ugly subject after treatment, right? First of all, guys, after treatment came out in, with SER in 2011 2012 time frame we had uh dpf and doc as early as 2007 so if you don't know after treatment yet you know i don't know what to tell you you know we're now in 2024 you ought to know after treatment if not take a class take a webinar whatever i got on demand courses on my website you know whatever learn after treatment for christ's sake because even this past weekend I can't tell you how many texts I had that did not know that when DEF fluid's injected, it converts into ammonia. They didn't know that. They didn't know that a RAM application has an ammonia slip catalyst. So in this case, so should you. So therefore, there's you need to know, again, what ap happens. So do you ever think about the effects of poor diesel engine operation on an after-treatment system? You know, And we see it time and time again. If this thing has 280,000 miles and hasn't been taken care of, and it's just puke and blow by, guess what it's going to affect your after treatment? If that turbo's got some oil leaks, we got intake leaks, you got injector, poor quality stuff, whatever, it's going to affect the after treatment. And the classic story I've been saying for years is I put myself on that downpipe right here, you know, and I'm like, you know, it's at the mercy of whatever. In other words, this after treatment is at the mercy of the quality of the exhaust that's coming out. In other words, the smoke that's coming out, should there be smoke? And that's why we've been telling you for quite a while that if you suspect that you got something hurting your after treatment, maybe in your diagnostic, it's a good idea to uncork that downpipe. And there's that flange right there. And what you're going to do is just move it slightly over. It's not, it's a pain in the butt, but just move it slightly over and let's just see what's the smoke color coming out of that engine, you know? And for those of you that have never seen me or heard me talk about this, we have uncorked so many that we have had some just puke, some blackish, brownish smoke. Some of them had oil in it. You know, we've had many different issues going on, which was affecting our after treatment system. And this is a truck that comes from another shop that's complaining that they already cleaned the DPF or they replaced the DPF several times. So we have to know how it works. But the scary part is, you know, I'll be honest with you, there's controversy about after treatment. And that is, you know, we just saw, and everybody's been talking about on different YouTubes, you talk about looking for content for their channels, is that we all know about Cummins getting busted. But here's the thing that people are not talking about, like I mentioned in the round table, is that, you know, the first thing I'm worried about is, as you know, these trucks are getting a recall and they're going to get reprogrammed. The fix is going to be a reflash reprogram. 
My question is, is that how those trucks going to behave or what issues are they going to have with the new updated conforming, you know, emission conforming program in it? So I'm like, oh, God, this could start a whole nightmare. You know, it's like if these trucks are running, you know, these SERs and DPFs, they're going to be ultra sensitive to anything with NOx or anything going on with the particulate filter, or maybe they're doing something with fueling. You know, it's like, oh God, what's gonna happen? You know, are they gonna be derated in power, whatever? So in this case, what I'm trying to say is, you know, that's the other issue. But here's the other thing, you know, from, from me as an independent, I've been working with diesels and, and so on, is that, you know, how I never thought in, you know, coming back from the old school days, you know, and I've had other guys that have attended my classes agree that, I never thought I would see a manufacturer cheat. I mean, when VW got busted a few years ago and we see other companies and Bosch and Duramax get busted. I mean, these are all reputable companies. And, you know, and by the way, that 1.675 billion is a drop in a bucket in reality to come as because if you know how big they are worldwide. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, why are they cheating? You know, why are they getting busted? Why are we doing it? Because have we gotten to a point that we are no longer can meet those emissions? I guess what I'm trying to say is, like I said at the round table is, I would like to see manufacturers push back, you know, say, hey, this is as far as we can go. But then on the other hand, I've had technicians saying, well, don't these trucks, don't they come with 400, 500 horsepower with over 1, 1,100 foot pounds of torque? Yeah. So they're pushing the horsepower and the torque. And this is just a one ton pickup. Because if you know medium duty, what do they do to medium duty? For those who don't know, for medium duty applications, what do they do for that same application? Let's say a 6.7 Cummins. Is that 6.7 medium-duty application have the same horsepower and torque like a Ram truck? Nope, they're derated. You look at cab chassis for Ford on the 6.7. Is the cab chassis truck derated? Yep. So in this case, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, the, I guess the technician said it best in the class, and he said, you know, if you can't meet the emissions, then why make the horsepower? And that's very true. So in this case... With them, my scary thought is what's going to be coming into the shops and are these guys going to try to evade? Because, you know, I already talked to a few truck owners. They're like, I ain't taking it in. I ain't taking it in. I'm not going to get updated. So we're going to see what happens with that. So ah, hold on. Stay tuned on what may happen there, you know. So it's like what's going to happen. So, again, we got to understand how it works. So one of the key things that I see good techs do, and I ran into a few good techs too. I don't think I saw all bad. You know, they're like, you know, Tony, I'm trying to diagnose this not reduction issue. And I did the test on the reductant injector, which you see on the picture right there. In other words, the guy that injects the reductant or the death fluid. And he understood that it converts to ammonia, but he did the proper test. In other words, he followed the scan tool service information too. And what he did was he did the spray test, the volume test, and then he tested the actual death fluid. So, you know, I think I saw a question there earlier on the chats when I first started is that, you know, what is the... The best way to test A, diesel, and death fluid. Because nowadays in today's society, you don't know what you're dealing with, especially those of you that are servicing fleets or, you know, business type of trucks, is that you now need to be tested those two. Again, the death fluid and the diesel. So Diesel Craft has been a good company, in case you want to know Diesel Craft. A lot of people will know them out in the industry. They st sell test strips for A, testing your death fluid, but you're also going to use a ref refractometer. Because with the death fluid, what you're doing with those test strips from diesel craft is you're testing for contamination for diesel and other things. In other words, did that person put diesel into the death? Because everybody knows that the biggest issue we're seeing is people putting death into the diesel. I get it. But in this case, we also see the opposite. Okay. So in this case, it's wise to know that I want to be tested because that's what we need to have in our shops nowadays. And I, 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 don't, I know what you're saying. Another thing to buy. Yeah, I get it. But in this case, yeah, you need to test that fuel and that death fluid to make sure that it is not contaminated again. So there's your answer to that question. In case you asked that, I believe there was a question on that. I can't click on it right now. But in this case, that's what we're seeing. All right. So we have to understand how to what these systems are. So what is the biggest headache we got with these puppies is actually they're going into D-rate. You know, they're going into D-rate. So if they're going into D-rate, you know, now we're dealing with software issues. And I probably have started saying this as of this year or earlier, too, was that, let's face it, and some of you will agree, is that today's SCR software on many manufacturers sucks. I mean, boy, does it suck. You're following the procedures that they're telling you to do, you know. And in this case, you know, you're uh, 
you're going to find out that it doesn't work every time. But it's coming to the point. That's why it goes back to the beginning of this presentation. That is, you got to make sure they're doing or you're doing the update programming. On. Because have I had a GM truck, for example, an LML Duramax? Have I had an LML Duramax that actually is in D-rate and I'll run the reductant fluid quality test? And I'm running it. And I'm running it. And the thing is, it's still running. And I'm like, well, holy cow, I've been running it now for over 45 minutes and it's still running. And all it says on the damn scan tool screen is test in progress. And you're like, okay, what are you supposed to be testing, by the way, on the reductant fluid quality test is that he's supposed to be running and testing for NOx. So I'm like, okay, 45 minutes have gone by. All right. So I finally say, screw it. I kick it out, turn it off. But then you read the fine print and it says there, on the bulletin or in the scan tool or any information regarding the issue you're testing. And it'll say, ensure that you have the latest update program. So there you see me calling my guy that does my update programming. I said, come update and program it. He programs it. He leaves. Okay, let's start the reductive fluid quality test. We prep the truck, get it going. And within eight minutes, boom, it's D-rate is gone. The message is gone on the dash. We're good to go. You know, so that kind of sucks. And it's happened to me with all the big three, by the way. So therefore, it happens to we got to have the latest program. So that's what we got to make sure. So that's another issue. So it isn't if you do call me, say, Tony, I got this issue with this truck and D-rate. You know, it's like, what do I do? And it's like, you know, first of all, do you have the latest update program? That's what I'm going to tell you. Because if you already did those basic steps to get out of D-rate. But then Ford is the interesting one, because with Ford, you got to run uh, some drive cycles. And if not, you're going to have to do like this bulletin I just got by my friend Lee that Ford has put out, you know, to actually run the truck hard, you know, let's let's get it running, you know. So that's another procedure. And if you like a copy of that bulletin, let me know. But in this case, yeah, it's a big pain in the butt to get them out of D-rate. But it all goes back to the basics I've been showing. In the past, I've shown this video where we see the messages going on. Look at this video right here. You're going to notice that this truck, you know, if you haven't understood this, I don't know, because I still get issues with phone calls and I've been talking about it in my classes, is that, you know, here we can see this truck right here. This is actually an F650 or 750. I forgot which one it was. 650 or 750, because you'll notice there's no park right there. And in this case, this was a big, big, big tow truck. And anyways, you're going to see there's no check engine light. Yes, the engine is idling, as you can see on the screen. But in this case, we don't have... No check engine light. Take a look right there. But what's it say in the middle? That it's going to derate it in 50, excuse me, in 44 miles, it's going to derate it to 50. So it's going to, it's getting rated derate, right, in 44 miles. But you'll notice there's that magical symbol right there. So if you still haven't learned what that symbol is, that's, <laughs> guys, you got to know it by now. What's that light telling you? One of two things, like I've said before, it hasn't been able to reduce inadequate NOx reduction, or B, it's telling you it hasn't been able to verify NOx reduction. Now, I know I don't have a fault here. I don't have a problem here. This truck does not have a problem. You're like, what are you talking about, Tony? Yeah, because there's no check engine light. And that check engine light means that there's no emission-related failure there. So if it was a failure, you know, there would be a check engine light on. In other words, a mill light. So therefore, what I'm looking at there is, yeah, he's threatening because he's telling me with that light right there, you see in that symbol, he's telling me that um, I haven't been able to verify NOx. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you know it hasn't been verified? Because there's no check engine light. Because that light means one of two things. Okay? One of two things. Again, he hasn't been able to reduce NOx, which would clearly have a check engine light. Or B, he hasn't been able to verify. One thing is to verify. One is to find a fault. So he's telling me right here that's the problem. And like many trucks like this truck right here, what was the fix? Well, the fix was, you know, was to run a regeneration. So I took a chance. And in this case, those of you seen this video, I'm sorry you already seen it. But in this case, what what I did was, you know, I pretty much ran a regeneration. However, though, I do show on this video where I'm actually showing my scan tool hooked up, and you're going to notice there's no powertrain powertrain related codes. Everything's passing, so there's nothing wrong. But what he does need help with is what he needs help with. Actually, running a what a a regeneration. Now, why did I run regeneration? Because in order to test for NOx, we need heat in the exhaust. So the funny thing, let me fast forward this video here. You're going to find out towards the end here. I'm showing it was a hot summer day that I did this. But you're going to notice that, you know, I got the the load. Uh, in other words, the amount of deep suit loading. God damn it. My new suit load was low. But you're going to notice the message went away. 
So in this case, what we're clearly trying to show is even during a regen event, which surprised me, the system is monitoring for NOx reduction. So I got the exhaust hot by running the regeneration. And by running it hot, it was able to get to that temperature that it needed to test for NOx reduction. And voila, the message went away. So we have to understand that with these after treatment systems on these trucks, their biggest Achilles heel or weakness is that they don't reach those light off temperatures, as we call them, those temperatures that we need in order to reduce NOx. So again, it kind of goes back to what do we need to know now? And you have these are all Mustangs, because remember, the title of this presentation is Where Are You At? And the thing is for 2024. So yeah, these are pretty much basic one-on-ones that you should know by now, because like I said, SCR has been around for a while. Again, I don't want to deter you, okay? I don't want to make you feel bad. All I'm saying is, if you don't know this stuff, then you should know it by now because it's already 2024 and this crap's been around for quite a long time. So if you don't know it, shame on you, you know? You got to know this stuff. So, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. But what about when you get interesting codes like that PO606? I've had deal with that code for a long time, even before 2003, the PO606 code, right? And the thing is, I had one guy call me and he had me going crazy. We're trying to figure out his problem. I'm like, you know, dude, I got to research you. I'm going to have to call you back. You know, it's just that. Then they call him back. I said, this is what I came up with. He says, you know, I forgot to tell you, Tony, you, I do have a PO606 code. And I'm like, <laughs> you didn't tell me that. <laughs> Take a look at the description or theory of operation there. It says, or this fault code is triggered when the internal PCM diagnosis detect a read or write error internal to the module. This fault code can only be caused by internal PCM problem. There's your answer. So in this case, what's typically the fix? Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I have fixed a few PO606 on various different trucks by simply flashing them. That did fix it. But guess what happened two months, three months, or even a week later was that code came back. So therefore, usually it means it that power and grounds are good going to the PCM too. But it usually means that, yeah, I may have a bad PCM. So therefore, you know. That's something you got to keep in mind there. So therefore, yeah, watch out for that. You know, it's like, I don't know what to tell you. But anyways, yeah, P, please, the, some codes are pretty much cut and dry. In other words, most PO606 that I've had that I, well, like I said, some I fixed with reflash, but it was only short term, but some of them did work. And then the other ones was I had a relay PC, relay problem where I had a voltage drop. I had low voltage going to the computer. Oh, we had a charging system problem. And always remember something, by the way, now that I bring up charging system problems, remember, computers don't like AC. So that's why in, we still should be doing AC ripple tests or AC tests to make sure we don't have AC leakage going into these computers. Because if you're buying a cheap, you know, reman, rebuild, uh, alternator generator, that could be a problem because you don't know if they're replacing or just testing the diodes and sending them on their way on, within that new alternator generator. So watch out for that. So there you go. All righty. Hopefully that's helping you out. But uh, again, something to look out for. I did have a question there. Uh, what, what did you ask for? Uh, in this case, is it true that DEF system will be going away soon? I've heard those rumors too, but at this time, I don't see it happening. As long as these manufacturers continue to put these high horsepower and torque, you got to have some post cleanup. And that current post cleanup is SCR to reduce that knock. So, so to answer your question, sir, no, I don't think it's going to happen because... There's no new technology that's going to help us with that. So there you go. All right. So that's pretty much, I'm a little early there. David, I'm a little, I went on one hour and 10 minutes here. I'm a little early, but I uh, thought I'd cover that. So guys, in a nutshell, and I'm sure David can reinforce this, is that if some of these subjects that I hit hard and heavy for did not get you to understand that you're dealing with more networks because I can put a 2022 truck up there and it would take me like four or five screens of this PowerPoint slides and other five slides in order for me to show you the whole network for just powertrain and powertrain only, you know, you're going to be lost. So if that basic one that I showed you was not good enough or you don't understand voltage drop testing or you don't know charging and starting systems, you're going to really be struggling. And that's what I've been finding at shops. So it's not something that I'm trying to make you feel bad, but something to wake you up and tell you, hey, I need to get up to speed with this stuff. So what do you think, David? Do you agree? I agree completely, yes. Uh, if you just want to show your next slide with some uh, contact information, that would be great as well. 
Um, just uh, I will I will come back to to some of your questions here in a moment, but I just wanted to uh, show this slide. If anybody's got any questions or any comments, uh, we really would appreciate comments on uh, Tony's presentations uh, because, like that, we would know what to bring you in the future. Uh, you like them? Uh, what 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 would you like? I, I cannot say do you don't like them because I would imagine everybody loves them. Uh, I personally. Uh, get a lot out of it. Uh, but one of the comments I had going back to this here is Tony's favorite thing is when the vehicle comes in the shop, check the battery. Uh, where I'm located in the Kansas City metro area, uh, up until this week, it's been extremely cold. And by extremely cold, maybe not quite as bad as, you know, way up in Canada, but we're talking about, you know, minus 10, minus 15 Fahrenheit. Um, and when you have a vehicle sitting outside, uh, it's pretty cold. And if you don't check the battery, when that vehicle comes into the shop, the vehicle might come into the shop and the engine's warm. It starts up quickly. Uh, there's no problem with it. But uh, if it's been outside in the cold, it might not even start. So one of the one of Tony's favorite things is let's go back to the elementary things. The very first thing you should check is the battery. Correct, Tony? And, you know, it's funny. Like I said, I was working at a shop for a week doing training. And we yeah. did on vehicle diagnostics. They had over 12 vehicles in the shop. Four of them needed batteries. Yeah. 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 Especially it's, you know, this part of the world that's extremely cold. So, um, you know, and if you're in other places, well, then, you know, it might not suffer until way later on. But you could have a battery that's only a few years old and it's just no good anymore. I believe, Tony, you answered most of or all of the questions in the chat here. Um. I believe you did on this one. Other than it's the, there's one here at the very beginning says, do you recommend any fuel testing kits for testing fuel quanti quality and contamination? Did you answer that one, Tony? I'm sorry, which one? It's the first one. It says, do you recommend any fuel testing kits? Oh, yeah, I did answer that. That's the diesel craft, the one I mentioned okay. for the test strips made by diesel craft. That's the Oscar. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. very good. Okay, and, I was. Uh, and Matthew was saying here that at a Ford network and communication event we attended last year, the instructor told the story about a failed tail light causing a network shut down. Yeah. And it caused a no start. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's something we've been seeing too. And Lee can even tell you that. I know Lee's in the tens, but he could tell you how we've seen other modules can shut down the network. So we have to understand how to network, mm -hmm. how to test the network. And by the way, when you got instructors out there, I'm going to put them on the spot. I hate it when they advertise. Can network diagnosis made easy? No, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And if I, I've been watching BMW techs, Audi techs do their thing. And it's funny because we don't see too many problems on the wiring itself. It's a module that could be shutting down. In other words, from my experience, what I've been seeing more is a module itself is shutting down the network. So we're playing this unplugging module game. Well, let's see if it communicates now after unplugging this. Let's unplug this. Because to isolate where it is, when you got five modules on a local network and you're trying to find out why it don't communicate, it's not been the wiring. From my experience, a lot of it has been the module itself has been shutting down the rest of the network. So that sucks. But yeah. Very good. So uh, just as a one closing comment, uh, for those of you who are participating here in the webinar, if you have any other uh, fellow technicians that wish to participate, the webinars are free, so pass the word along and, uh, you know, get them to sign up or, or give me a call or give, send me an email. I'll put them on the database. And then as soon as the webinar date is uh, um, finalized, we will send you an email and let you know when the next uh, webinar is going to be now for uh, February. So with that, I want to thank you very much, Tony, as always, tremendous information. And for those of you who maybe didn't catch everything or got interrupted, uh, the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel on the diesel on the Lucas Diesel Systems uh, web uh, uh, web uh, channel on the YouTube channel rather, uh, as well as Tony uh, places it on his uh, on his um, uh, website. So with that, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next month again for another webinar. Thank you very much, Tony. Take care.